Hello everyone and welcome to this joint presentation about the engineering opportunities in bulk materials handling prepared by Richard Alibrand and Eddie McGee. Richard is the Process Safety Management Superintendent at Westlake Vinolet and Eddie is the Managing Director at Ajax Equipment. I am Maurice Wellington, Vice Chair of the IMECE Process Industry Division Northwestern Centre and I'll be chairing this event and the Q&A at the end. Please submit your questions throughout the event using the question box and we'll direct them to our speakers later. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available on demand along with the presentation slides. So over to Richard to start the presentation. Hello, my name is Richard Hellebrand. I've worked as a mechanical engineer in the process industries for nearly 40 years. Today, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about the scope, the science and the technology of bulk materials handling. I'll also describe some of the tasks that engineers do. I'm happy to ask, answer your questions either in the webinar or via the email address that's on the screen. OK, so let's start with the agenda. So what is bulk materials handling? What sectors is it involved in? Something about behaviour? dust explosions and safety, the science involved, common types of processing equipment, and then some examples um, from spray drying. Examples also of uh, where bulk and handling engineers work, uh, drawn from my own career uh, in the industry, and then why should we consider a, a career in engineering. There are a lot of links at the end to resources, um, they will hopefully be available in the WorkCast system as well. So what is bulk materials handling? Well, it's an engineering field centred on the design of equipment used for the handling of loose materials. They can be powdery, granular or lumpy in nature. It's fundamental to most industry sectors. And bulk materials can range in size from huge boulders through granular materials such as sand and cement to food crops and even fine powders that can fluidize and flow like water. You might think of talcum powder and even finer powders than that. So products handled range from easy flowing granules to sticky powders, also to dangerous materials that pose significant health and safety risks. For example, many powders can be ignited and explode when there are dust clouds. Bulk material handling systems are typically composed of machines such as size reduction using crushes and mills, conveyors, ship, road and rail systems, silos, hoppers, feeders, diverters, mobile plant equipment such as excavators, loaders, crushers, conveyors and screens. And those can be from the small to the huge. Um, if you look on YouTube, you'll find lots of examples of really big machinery. Modern bulk handling systems feature integrated machinery controlled and sequenced via advanced process control systems, in other words, computers, such as DCS, which is a distributed control system, or SCADA, supervisory control and data acquisition. A lot of industry sectors use bulk materials handling. Here's a, a snapshot of just some of the UK sectors. I added up that there's around about a billion tonnes per year just in the UK and obviously it's a, a worldwide uh, industry. Here's some example photos on the top left, a giant tunnelling machine of the sort that they use for railways and roads to the Alps and maybe for the Channel Tunnel. We have pharmaceutical powders, pellets, cereal crops we need to feed the world and in the bottom right biomass pellets for power stations like Drax. Lots of types of polymers and plastics, cement for construction, mining. This is a giant uh, cutting wheel that removes the overlay above coal mines and quarrying in the, the bottom right hand corner, the example being limestone. Bulk materials behave in very different ways to fluids and gases. 
They consist of many individual particles in which stress is transferred between them and the containing vessel or pipe. This is via frictional forces rather than viscous forces. And because of this, bulk solids form piles. Unlike liquids, bulk materials are usually compressible. The bulk density typically changes as a function of the consolidating pressure and the particle size. And large, irregularly shaped particles can form interlocking structures or a line in a silo, making discharge difficult. Fine powders can exhibit solid gas interactions that make them prone to flooding, fluidization, or a reduced feed rate. And many materials can bridge or rat hole as a result of their cohesive strength. I'll show you a slide about that in a minute. Blended powders can demix, can segregate or stratify during storage and transfer. Now we need to understand how materials behave when stored and when flowing. Getting this wrong is very costly. A range of problems including blockages, quality, energy, operating maintenance costs, etc. etc. From a safety perspective, when people clear out the block materials, this may also require confined space entry into vessels and there may be the potential for a dust cloud explosion. How bulk materials flow is dependent on combination of material and equipment. An easy flowing bulk material in the wrong equipment becomes difficult to handle. Conversely, the situation is even worse for poorly flowing materials in the wrong equipment. So when designing a bulk materials handling system, engineers must be aware of relevant material properties and select accordingly. Tests um, that might be needed, bulk density as a function of compaction, and this varies with the depth of, of product of powder stored. Wall friction, that determines how easily a powder slides down a chute or down a wall. Shear strength determines resistance to actually starting the bulk flow. And the cohesive strength test provides some guidance for opening sizes to avoid flow stoppages by, caused by arching and rat holing. Lastly, permeability measures the resistance to gas flow through the bulk solid. When understood, the results are used to design equipment that will be reliable, doesn't block, and doesn't give quality issues. Many dust clouds can be ignited. If the dust is confined in a building or process equipment, the pressure rise can cause an explosion. The primary explosion can be small, but actually if it dislodges nearby accumulated dust from beams and, and structures into the air, we can get a further secondary explosion. These could be far more destructive than the primary explosion. Many deaths have been caused by secondary explosions. This is a, a photograph from uh, 2008 from Imperial Sugar. You can see the destruction and a number of people were killed. And unfortunately, this is not rare and we get dust explosions throughout the world every year. Ignition energy, temperature, and concentration data is available for many powers, but this should be tested for typical process conditions using actual samples rather than just rely on generic data. This is too big a topic to discuss now, but it's important to check out that you can access appropriate risk assessments and ATEX data. Bulk materials are stored in vessels from small bins up to huge bunkers. These pictures show some examples of flow patterns. On the left is the idealised mass flow vertically downwards, almost laminar. The second picture in shows that the powder or material has bridged just above the, the narrow outlet so there's actually no flow. The third one's where there's a rat hole, no idea where it's called a rat hole but, but that's what it is and we have stagnant powder built up on the side walls with only flow through the middle and then finally we have a picture of stratified or unevenly mixed powder. This, um, this can be mixes of different types of powders that you want blended in certain proportions or it can be different particle sizes of the same powder but either way when they become unmixed then we have a quality problem. Careful specification of new storage vessels will minimise those problems. In existing vessels um, to overcome these there are many types of aftermarket device to keep material moving from vibrating uh, widgets on the sides to in internal vibrators, impact hammers, 
uh, ultrasonics uh, and other acoustic devices and then even internal air cannons to fire the, the powder off the side walls. When we're aiming for a particular particle size, we need to use size reduction machines. Now the most common types of these are crushers that break large solids into smaller lumps. And there are various types from uh, jaw crushers to lump crushers. Grinders and mills that take those large lumps and reduce them down to powder. Hammer mills, rod mills, disintegrators, etc., etc., down to colloid mills. And if we want the really finest, uh, smallest powder particle sizes, then we will be using classifiers fitted on hammer mills or agitated mills or air impact mills. To give you an idea of the range, this chart uh, has a, a scale on the bottom from one meter down to one nanometer. And one nanometer is one billionth of a meter or 10 to the minus nine of a meter. At the top of it, you can see uh, the dry technology and the bottom, the wet um, technology. And we always end up with uh, problems when we're trying to handle damp material because it's really neither one thing nor the other. Conveyors are used to move bulk materials. The, the most common types of powered rather than gravity conveyors are belt conveyors, there's the photo on the left there, a screw conveyor, uh, there's one on the right there, pneumatic conveyors, or they just look like pipes which we blow powder through, roller conveyors, vibrating conveyors, bucket conveyors, and various types of dragging or chain conveyors. Drying, so we've got, we've, we've broken down our big lumps, we've conveyed them somewhere, they might be damp, we need to dry them. So there are indirect dryers for very sensitive materials so that the heat source is independent of the insides of the vessel or the dryer. But most common are the direct dryers. So these transfer heat to the material by convection. There's lots again of types, batch ones, uh, where you just put something inside an oven on a tray, or continuous ones. A picture is a rotary dryer, very common. There are also tunnel, vacuum, fluidized bed, flash dryers, spray and spray dryers. I'll talk a bit more about that on the next slides. So spray drying, uh, it's used in many uh, industries. Water or other fluids containing desired product is sprayed into hot air stream to evaporate the liquid, leaving just powder. It's a continuous drying technique with a very short residence time at high temperature, and that allows the drying of heat sensitive products because really they're not in the vessel long enough to start to burn or degrade. Examples are powdered milk, instant coffee, plenty of other foodstuffs, detergents, soaps, surfactants uh, for your dishwasher or uh, washing machine. Lots of fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, really anything that you want in a powder form. Caustic soda can be turned into pearls of caustic soda, becomes a solid. Pigments, pharmaceuticals, enzymes, polymers, just goes on. Here's a typical flow sheet. So um, let's just see if we can get the pointer up. So we end up, we start off with the, the liquid containing a suspension or emulsion the powder. We pump it in through some sort of distributor. Commonly these are on spinning wheels or a, a series of spray nozzles. The damp material goes down through the spray dryer and it also goes co-current co with hot air. Typically we filter some fresh air through a fan and we, we heat it up with gas or steam. So we have a heat source and blown in product. And by the time it gets to the bottom, they, um, the liquid has turned to a vapor. So we can then start to separate the solids from the damp, now damp airstream. And the damp air ultimately is removed through cyclones or bag filters and exhausted out. Dry powder comes out of the bottom of a rotary valve. Often that damp air is also re, uh, recircular, or the heat from it is recovered 
and fed into the fresh. Here's an example from my own career. This is a pretty big spray dryer. It's 12 meters diameter, about um, 1400 cubic meters in volume. To give you an idea of the scale as well, the ducts diameters in and out are about two meters. So this one, big gas burner, um, heating up air going in, being swirls. There are a series of then spray nozzles. Uh, and these take a mixture of water with PVC as an emulsion and compressed air. So that's sprayed in to the hot air stream coming down. It comes out the bottom and then goes through a really big bag filter or bag filters where the damp air is disentrained and sent out to atmosphere and the dry powder is collected. There are rotary valves underneath uh, which then take the dry powder out and it goes on the rest of the process. I haven't shown heat recovery, but heat recovery is there as well. The reason I've shown it is because the bigger the dryer, generally the more the handling problems. In this particular case, we had a lot of buildup. So this was caused by recirculation. And when you get that, you can get overheating. This is um, CFD. It shows you the, the hotter particles towards the red where you're getting this recirculation. So we were able to use CFD to model the paths taken by the particles and then redesign the dryer. The same spray dryer, just a picture at the top to show you the arrangement of compressed air and liquid feed linked by hoses into spray nozzles. And also to show you that you can use thermal imaging to detect buildup. Um, and blockages, not just in spray dryers, but in many things. If the, on this picture here, the dark blue hose is dark blue because it's cold, the flow has stopped. And you can use that whenever polymers are dried. Polymers in particular, they form plastic skins. Obviously plastic is not a very good um, conductor, it's a good insulator. So uh, it doesn't work with every bulk solids, but it does work with polymers. So where do, they, where do engineers work? Well, after qualifying, engineers develop a range of technical and managerial skills, which, which allow them to diversify into a wide range of roles. In bulk, the, 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 the areas in which engineers typically work are design, manufacture, sales and marketing, actual process design, not just the equipment, in the manufacturing industries, particularly reliability and maintenance, project engineering, project management, engineering management, that's at sort of wider level that includes projects, maintenance, reliability, facilities, energy and environmental management. The processing of bulk solids is energy intensive. Uh, it can also create waste so a lot of expertise can be built up that can be used in, in energy and environmental management. Process safety, I mentioned dust explosions but there are other areas as well and consultancy. Testing, certification and approval so a, a wide range of um, career opportunities. So to illustrate some of these I'll now chat about bulk materials handling in my own career. Uh, my four year mechanical engineering degree course was at Brunel and it included one and a half years of industrial training at Universal Abrasive in Stafford. I learned, like everybody does, some basic workshop skills, then gained experience in maintenance projects and accounting. A lot of equipment, furnaces, conveyors, jaw crushers, hammer mills. Interesting, the hammer life for abrasives was maximum two minutes very often just 90 seconds for a, a hammer the size of a house brick made of high density steel. That's how abrasive it was. Then the, uh, the as the product gets smaller, roll mills, washing to remove impurities with acid um, and sieving through uh, screens. The final powder was used for abrasive wheels and papers and specialist products. The main challenge was abrasion, but also it's high energy. So energy consumption. 
video. After uni then I went actually joined the coal industry, uh, more particularly the smokeless fuels. I spent two years as a graduate trainee learning about processes. I then worked for five years as a mechanical engineer at two coking works. Two photographs there of the coke works, uh, Dew and Taff in the northeast and Cum in South Wales. So we carbonised coal to make coke for steel foundries. Lots of equipment, big stuff. Um, locomotives, loaders, silos, bunkers, conveyors of lots of types, milling, gas compressors, boilers, steam turbines. So I organised all the mechanical maintenance and reliability for all of that lot, um, rely improvements and associated projects. The main problem in these sorts of industries again is abrasion but also high temperature. So tribology, the science of materials and wear particularly important, also good knowledge of alloys. This is just a, a picture I took um, a long, long time ago on the left of a coke oven being discharged. And if you look at the section on the right, coke ovens involve a battery, which is uh, where the coal is loaded into. The, the coal is heated indirectly to about 1100 centigrade. When it's um, heat, it turns into coke then because it drives all the volatile materials, the tars and the gases, for collection and use uh, and, and use as byproducts. When the oven is finished, there's a pusher machine, uh, which is huge. We're talking 30, 40 meter long ram, one and a half, two meters tall uh, across section here. And it pushes the coal or the coke I should say, out through a guide car. You can see it tumbling then into a, a catch car driven by a loco, which then takes it along, quenches it with water so the coke doesn't burn, and then it starts this process through, uh, again, more crushers, mills, conveyors, screens, etc., to become the final product. It's no longer made in the UK. So you think, well, is, is there any relevance? Well, yes, there is, because 600 million tonnes is still made each year in other countries. Look it up, look up Coke Oven on YouTube for some videos. I moved, after that, I moved into speciality chemicals industry, namely uh, AH Marks in Bradford, it, it's now New Farm. I worked in lots of engineering technical management roles for the next 13 years. Although most of it was liquid, a number of end products were sold as powders, granules, flakes, most were herbicides, but there were also pharmaceuticals. A couple were highly explosive. I mean, hit it with a hammer, it blows up explosive. So bulk solids are not all the same. Processes, um, specialist centrifuges there, again for the explosive products, flakers, dryers, vibratory conveyors, bucket elevators, belt conveyors and packaging. In this industry, the solids are typically sticky. Corrosion is more of an issue than abrasion, so metallurgy is key. Much of the job was in maintenance management and projects. The scope included organisational management, budget, supervision, training, reliability, energy, designs, sustainability, risk assessment, specification and commissioning, to name but a few areas. After uh, AH Marks, I moved to Blackpool to work at a PVC residence site at Hill House at Thornton Cleveley's near Blackpool. PVC, as you probably know, is used for drinking water pipes and windows and cables, medical products, but so much more as well. It's a huge industry. After vinyl chloride is polymerised in pressurised reactors to make polyvinyl chloride, the resultant latex is fed into the big spray dryer I showed you earlier to produce a very fine white powder. This was then conveyed in pneumatic and screw conveyors through air filters, sieves, hoppers, rotary valves and classifier mills into automated packaging. My job was mainly organising reliability and projects. The scope included management, budgets, supervision, skills development, reliability, energy, design, risk assessment, specification and commissioning. I spent much of my time as a projects engineer and when you look at reliability, Design out is often the best solution. Don't just try and fix the rubbish, 
if you've got the money, try and replace it with something that doesn't need the maintenance, or certainly the level of maintenance in the first place. So why have a career in engineering? Well, although studying engineering is hard, a career in it can be really rewarding. Your technical qualifications and experience will be valued in all industry sectors. In my career, I've been able to regularly do all of the following. People skills to manage and develop teams and individuals, including me, and perhaps most importantly me. Thinking of new ideas for improvements that will solve problems or expand capacity. Working with teams to develop ideas from initial concept to projects. Leading various types of risk assessment. Developing process and mechanical designs and specifications. Then discussing these with contractors to get the best combinations of technical solutions and costs. Financially justifying projects to get the funding. Sourcing equipment, integrating and commissioning it. Sometimes even working on the tools with the tradesmen. Having the satisfaction of solving a problem and updating, um, uprating production capacity. Project and people management of all of the above. And to do this, you really need to concentrate on your time management, use to-do lists, because otherwise it can be overwhelming. Self-study for CPD, and this never stops. It's perhaps easier, easier than ever nowadays. Good engineers get freedom. What I mean by that is if you earn some trust, managers will give you the freedom to organise your own work. And being proactive gives you much more job satisfaction than being reactive. If you enjoy problem solving, engineering is fun. Yeah, there are deadlines and stress, but there's also a good mix of office and site work, the intellectual and the practical. If you can become chartered, this can also open doors for advancement and pay increases. Although I've been talking for 30 minutes, this introduction to the bulk materials handling industry has raced through the topic. If you want to know a bit more, here are some internet links, all of them free. Hopefully we can answer any of your questions uh, in the webinar, but if you've got questions afterwards, please just send me an email at richard.hellebrand at member.imackey.org. Also, um, perhaps if you want to copy the slides, I'm happy to do that. Again, email me. OK, uh, that's me done. Uh, thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Eddie McGee. And I'm going to follow on from Richard's excellent presentation in today's session with perhaps a different point of view, that of the equipment supplier. I work for a small engineering company in Bolton, which specialises in bespoke design and manufacture of screw-based solids handling and processing equipment. Solids handling is one of the largest and most common processes across almost every industrial sector. However, it is often impeded by problems that arise in storage and handling. In this presentation, I will identify some of the problems often encountered, describe some of the tests needed for characterization of bulk solids, highlight aspects of hopper design needed for flow, discuss the importance of feeder selection I'll also show some case studies to illustrate how the approach actually works at solving plant operating problems. I'll give some examples of screw-based technology. Now I've worked at Ajax for 30 years and I find this a varied and interesting sector with many challenges. No day is the same, no job is the same. I'll round up with some pointers that hopefully you will find useful if you want to find out some more information. Bulk solids handling is by far the world's largest industrial activity. One survey finds that over 16 billion tonnes of common bulk solids, that is ores, sugars, grains, coal, etc., are handled every year, often many times. 
As Richard showed, there are many activities, storage, feeding, conveying, mixing, milling, drying, etc. From stacking and reclaiming of stockpiles to pyrolyzing biomass, even the food and confectionery we eat, solids are ubiquitous. Sometimes they're hidden in solution, as with some medicines or the ad blue that goes in car engines. Over the years, various reports have identified that solids handling plants perform far worse than those that handle liquids. Liquids, of course, and gases, we are familiar with their behaviours. We have various equations and we have good methodology for design of plants. Bulk solids behaviour is often less well understood, but often it's a failure to apply existing methodology and test methods that seems to cause the most issues. So here are some examples of some common flow problems. From arching in hoppers, on the top left, we have fine iron oxide powder arching over a slot outlet on a hopper. Top right is a similar arch, but this time it's a low density acicular like particles of biomass. And of course, both those situations means that no flow is coming out of the hopper. But just as awkward sometimes are the formation of stable rattles, which leave residue in hoppers, whether it's a few kilos in a titanium dioxide hopper on the bottom left, or hundreds of tons of coal in a bunker over a coking oven. And you can see in the middle upper slide that a, a nice V-shaped hopper is covered in hammer rash because the screw feeder that is fitted to it does not extract from the hole of the outlet. So flow blockages occur. And the middle bottom you can see a long shovel-like implement that an operator has to use to promote flow quite dangerously into a screw feeder. So what kind of hopper is best? So here is a simple conical hopper. Not much you can say except the operator is wearing a high-vis jacket while reaching out with a scaffolding pole to promote flow. On the right hand side, a more elegant hopper design with steep chiseled walls and multi-screw feeder, all of which gives far better flow conditions for reliable handling of the powder. So it might help sometimes to consider that bulk solids are almost a fourth state of matter sometimes combining the attributes of solids, as in when tableting is formed or when they hold their shape in the arch of a hopper, sometimes behaving like liquids when they flush uncontrollably or in process conditions like fluid bed dryers. Most of the life for a bulk solid is spent modestly compacted, whether that's in a hopper, a sack or other storage container. At other times it is only lightly confined, as on a belt conveyor or sliding down a chute or being handled in a screw feeder. So some observations on flow patterns and hoppers. I'm going to focus on the two main ones, funnel flow, where material is static against the walls of the container and extraction draws down a narrow core flow channel. And mass flow, where the first thin material is the first to come out because all of the material moves towards the outlet whenever any discharge takes place. Mass flow, of course, is characterized by steeper walls, but it also benefits from narrower outlets than you need on a core flow or funnel flow hopper. 
choosing the flow regime should always be based on the stability of the product and its flow property. So what flow characterization tests can we do? Primary, of course, is bulk density. Seems a trivial measurement to make, simply being for a known mass, how much volume does it occupy? But not so trivial when you consider inverting the cylinder it's measured in to get it in the very loose condition, tapping that cylinder to see if it settles, or even applying a weight to it to compress it. Wall friction. Another relatively simple test to do, sliding a cell containing powder over a contact surface and measuring the force to initiate slip for different weights upon the powder. And shear strength, a measure of how much strength it gains when it's consolidated with weights and sometimes with time. Wall friction tests and shear strength tests are key in identifying which slope of upper wall is needed for mass flow and how big the outlet is required. So mass flow has many advantages. As I said, makes flow through smaller outlets possible. With first in, first out, we will mitigate any segregation as all the material moves during discharge. But even better, if we can use a V-shaped hopper, we can get narrower outlets and shallower wall angles because the material only has to deform in one plane to get towards the outlet. If it was in a conical hopper to get from the diameter of the barrel to the diameter of the outlet, it would have to converge in two planes simultaneously, a task which is far harder. So what are the virtues of screw feeders? They provide positive transfer. Screw helix literally pushing the material along. Screws start and stop discharge, so nice flow control is possible. Totally contains the product, so there's no leaks of powder or closure to operator. They offer a compact construction without the dead return leg like a belt conveyor or a chain conveyor might have. Crucially though, as feeders they can serve long hopper outlets, so enhance capacity, save headroom, but only if the extraction profile is of the correct design. So what is important for interfacing screw feeders? If we've got a V-shaped hopper and we use a uniform pitch screw, there will be dead regions of extraction. So we risk blockages and arching. If we use a taper diameter screw, where we vary the, the, the OD of the screw, then it will have a very narrow width at the start. So that again risks uh, an arch. To fully serve long slots, we need more variety and the intake capacity along the hopper outlet. And this can be achieved by using combination of step shafts and variable pitch or a tapered shaft and variable pitch. So here's case study number one. Now this is a hopper and feed system for milled phosphate. You can see it's a pyramid shaped hopper, rotary valve, screw feeder, bucket elevator, all going up to a check wear prior to a mixing process. This was plagued with inconsistent flow, fine powder, loose condition, variable residence time, all exacerbated by what could only be a narrow flow channel due to the geometry of the hopper. A significant proportion of the contents remain static and consolidate to resist flow as the level falls. And occasionally deep rat holes can collapse, causing unpredictable flushing, such that the measured variation in feed rate on the belt conveyor 
was as much as 30 to 40 percent. So first thing to do, of course, is to do all the flow property tests. It confirms uh, what the wall friction angle is against the uh, stainless steel is seen to uh, be lower than against the mild steel of the existing construction. And the bulk density showed a great difference between the tapped bulk density and the aerated or loose bulk density condition to characterise the material as poor flow. Shear strength measurements also confirmed that a large outlet was needed to promote flow. So what did the retroflow look like for the plant? Of course, it would have been too expensive to replete, replace completely with a new mass flow silo. But what we can do, and what we did do, was cut off the bottom part of the silo, fit a steep stainless steel V-shaped topper and a twin screw feeder. Here you see that new twin screw and feeder with its variable pitch and its variable shaft to serve the length of the hopper slot and using two screws means we fully sell the width and the V-shaped hopper made out of stainless steel. After these modifications, the variation as measured on the belt, the check wear, was under half a percent. So far more process stability was achieved. A second case study here involves a 4,000 tonne coal bunker. Now this is a coal bunker fitted over the coking ovens at steel plant and you can see very narrow and very tall rat holes form within the milled coal. And these meant that the live capacity was limited to between 30 and 40 percent. And not only that, these narrow flow channels frequently blocked and required intervention by the operators. That intervention entailed sticking a steel bar up the outlet and disturbing these rattles. Now you can imagine when all these tons of coal starts to move that that metal bar also moves too. And this resulted in many injuries to the operators. We did the tests. We came up with novel insert technology that basically created a more favourable flow shape geometry within the bunker. So much so that the live capacity after this was fitted approached 80% and no poking was required at all. A third example here, we compare the flow properties of carbon fibre and milled carbon fibre powder. So basically the same inherent material, but in different condition. One, a very light, low density, flaky, fibrous material. The other, a fine, less low density powder. So the powder tests indicated that yes, we needed a steep v weld hopper, but we could get away with quite a narrow outlet that was adequately served with a single screw with appropriate geometry. But for the fiber, we had to hold 10 cubic meters of this material and we couldn't converse the hopper at all because the material would have hung up on it. So to serve the barrel of that silo, we use six screws. And the astute among you will notice the spur gears connecting the screws are different sizes. So the screws then run it's with speed differentials, which help to promote flow as we change direction from the vertical flow out of the silo to the transverse flow from the feeder. So the mechanics of screw transfer are not just dependent on the swept volume. The helix angle of the flight and the material wall friction affect the efficiency with which the material goes from one pitch to the next pitch. 
And this aspect means that we can use different surface finishes to affect different transfer efficiencies. The result of which means that we can use high friction flights and low friction flights of identical geometry, i.e. outside diameter and pitch, and still serve the slot outlet of a V-shaped hopper. So this aspect is exploited in this bidirectional twin screw feeder. Two screws in a common casing that can run in opposite directions and feature the, the uniform geometry but different surface finishes. And because the screws are individually driven, if we decide to just deliver to one outlet, then the first screw can run at half the speed of the second screw and still serve quite a long outlet on a plain flow V-shaped hopper. So sometimes gravity is not enough and we need to promote flow into the screw. We can do this using agitated screw feeders where the integral hopper section above the screw features a multi-bladed agitator. This to keep it, the product in a live flow condition and help sweep the material towards the screw below. Agitated screw feeders are used for materials that are susceptible to arching, such as filter cake or fine cohesive powders. The example on the top left shows a five tonne capacity agitated screw feeder. The rotor itself is 1.6 metres diameter and it's made out of Hastelloy because of chemical uh, conditions. The top right shows uh, a vertical agitator into a horizontal agitated section with a small screw feeder for handling pharmaceutical powders. And you can see this is robustly constructed, many large bolts on the flange at the top. And this is because the equipment was designed for steam sterilization at pressure in place. Agitated screw feeders are used where flow rates are low and thus screw diameters too small to present a sufficiently wide inlet for gravity flow. Screws can be used for process duties. Top left, we have a screw where we're also injecting liquid nitrogen to cool a polymer prior to grinding in a mill. In the top right, we have a jacketed screw for cooling char from a thermal process. In the bottom left, we have a high pressure inclined screw feeder, which pulls solids out of a solid bath, solvent bath. In the middle bottom is a photograph of a plug screw handling sawdust into a pyrolysis system. On the bottom right, you can see replaceable hard wearing paddles that are used in an ash conditioner for emptying drums. Sack tip systems are needed for safe and contained emptying of 25 kilo bags into dissolving tanks, etc. Rotors can be used to break up lumps of caked materials. And twin screw mixing technology is used for plastics processing, cereal bar making, and ash conditioning. The graphic on the top right shows positron emission particle tracking being used to confirm mixing capability of an Ajax mixer. So to conclude, every project is different. 
There's a wide range of materials being handled and processed. Behaviours can be variable, challenging even. Project demands vary with settings, standards, capacities, environments, logistics and layout, etc. Skills and experience develop over time, but interest and challenges continue to reward and motivate. What I would stress, of course, is that knowing your material is the key to project success whenever solids handling is involved. Here are a few pointers, various companies, various trade associations and technical resources at the IMECE, which might be helpful if you have a further interest in the topic. And the final slide here gives you the contacts at the IMECE. Thank you for your attention. I think uh, Morris has got his problem with his video. This is Richard, and I was a, the first presenter. Um, we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, hopefully, Morris can get his audio back. Um, the first question um, someone said is, it sounds complicated. Is there any way that runs bulk materials training? Um, well, I said I, I posted some links, and the Wolfson Institute um, based down at Greenwich do that. I'm not sure whether they're in person or online, but you can have a look at the range of courses that are there. Uh, Maurice, are you back yet? No, okay. Um, someone else has said, do we know how many members are in the IMACI? Um, oh God, um, it's somewhere between 115 and 130,000 from my for my knowledge. Um, a lot of them are in the UK, but pretty well every country worldwide has got IMECI members as well. Um, oh, we've got someone on the line. Morris isn't there yet. Um, there's one or two private questions which we'll answer separately, particularly uh, Keith um, Brewood has, has asked some questions, but I don't think they're for general. Um, people, uh, one or two people have said, can we get copies of the slides? Um, you can request this, uh, request this I think, through WorkCast. Um, alternatively, you um, either eddie at ajax.co.uk or me, richard.hellebrand at member.imekey.org. We're both happy to share our slides. Um, so, are there any further questions? Someone said, what are the main ways for small and medium enterprises to get involved in bulk material handling? Simulation stroke modeling, perhaps. Eddie, maybe maybe you can talk to that one. Yeah, d d cheers, uh, Richard. Yeah, um, I, I mean, obviously, I don't think either of our presentations talked too much about that. I know you had some CFD on yours. But uh, I, I think the main thing about uh, bulk materials handling is this aspect that, you know, there's literally millions of particles even in a big bag. So it's quite challenging to model. Um, and there aren't many particles that are perfectly spherical. They have awkward shapes. But there has been, in recent years, there's been a lot of work done by that. And uh, 
I know that there's um, the European Federation of Chemical Engineers. I know it's an alternative uh, company, uh, um, organization, sorry. Uh, they have a working party on the mechanics of particulate solids, and they do quite a lot of work on discrete element method. And I know that next week um, there is, a, there is a, a presentation that involves that. So if I can make a note of Toby's uh, email there, I will maybe send you, Toby, that, 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 that detail, if that helps. Yeah. Um, and there's a question as well. Um, how can we protect the screw from jamming from clots formed during the process? This problem damages the gearbox and, and kills the bearings. Um, Eddie, yeah. one for you again. I I, I guess I'd want to know where the jamming was occurring, if it was like blockage at the outlet of the screw conveyor, or if it's material trapping between the sweep of the flights and the and the casing, um, because you know what you would have to do would be different things, you know. Um, probably need a wee bit more detail on that before I could answer it properly. Okay. Um... We'll, um, we've got that person's email address, so Eddie, so maybe you can send them something a bit more detail. Yeah, okay. Um, so someone's a bit worried that we're trying to do a hard sell and screw conveyors. The reason we selected Eddie um, was because it isn't about selling screw conveyors, it's about illustrating the science involved in getting it right. And if you're designing a crusher or a mill or a conveyor, or another type of conveyor, it's all, I won't say equally complicated, but it's technical. So that's just a good snapshot of how to do things. So I hope that uh, hasn't yeah. upset anybody too much. Yeah, I, I, I'm very sorry if it's come across as a, a sales thing. I, I mean, the key thing here is understanding the materials. Of course, there's loads of different technologies for moving uh, powders and other bulk solids about. Uh, screw conveyors is the particular area that I have expertise in, but you know, it's, uh, it, I, I guess the key thing, and, and maybe yourself, Richard, might say something about this, is that a user has to assess the capabilities of uh, of the technology they're going to use, and then look at the uh, at, at the, the individual supplier. And, and, and I, think, I think there are, there are two halves to this. There's new equipment, which is obviously designed it from the ground up. We talked about that, but most of us don't have new equipment. Most of us inherit bunkers and conveyors and problems that we have to try and solve. So, for example, um, in the PVC industry, a lot of pneumatic conveying is used, low phase, dense phase. Um, and you think, oh, well, screw conveyor, yeah, it's slow and inefficient. But the problem with pneumatic conveyors is it's very, very high energy. There's high air flows. That means you need big bag filters to dis disentrain, high energy to blow it along. Um, you can have dust emissions. Um, high speeds can mean static problems depending upon the powder. That the advantage of screw conveying or even bucket conveying um, is it's a bit more agricultural if you like, but it doesn't have the energy impact and some of the environmental impact. So it's horses for courses. Um, and look, there's one or two other questions, but um, I mean, what someone said, what final year subjects to study? New, newly useful for bulk handling. Oh, crikey Moses, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, yeah. I'm not sure. I think any technical, if you're doing mechanical engineering, if you're doing chemical engineering, any of the things that you learn on solid, typical solids, fluids, mechanics, thermo, uh, thermodynamics, they're all useful. There is no better or worse. Um, they will all come in handy, but like all university schemes, you have to learn when you when you when you graduate. And I think we're up to our hour. So um yeah. if you've got any further questions, send them in and we'll try and answer them after the webinar. Um and thanks to Eddie um for, for his presentation. I'm Richard and thanks to Morris and hopefully his audio will work better next time. <laughs> all have a good day. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks for coming along. Yeah. Thanks for coming along. Bye. Yep. Hope you all found it interesting. We welcome feedback. Bye bye. Bye.